Okay, this is Dr. Morton uh, doing the Micro 2 lecture for Tuesday, the 14th of April. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about the technical features of the um, color sensor. So if we bring up, um, here's a good uh, description of it, if I can get most of this crap off of here. So so it has it has these pins, okay? Um, and again, this is this is this little device here. And and again, it's set up with uh, with uh, 64 photodiodes. 16 have a red filter. You can see the little red squares here. 16 have a green. You can see the little green squares. 16 have a blue. You can see the little blues. And 16 don't have filters. And uh, those those appear white, I believe. In any event, um, uh, what happens is when the uh, you well you use uh you and here's what it looks like of course mine doesn't have this plastic thing on here it's a little different and it doesn't have quite as many pins uh but in any event uh what happens is you have these control lines right here uh, i'll show you you have s0 s1 s2 and s3 two of these control lines pick the frequency scaling and two of them pick uh which which one of the four photo groups of 16 photodiodes are used to are being used to sense, and then a, a frequency that is proportional to the uh, incident light on the uh, selected photodiodes is output through this pin, and then power and ground, and then there's an output enable pin which uh, just has to. Uh, it's pulled high. You have to pull it low if you want to disable the output. Okay, so um, so here's the the pattern for for the two control pins two and three that pick the color. So if they're both low, you're sensing uh, through the 16 uh, photodiodes that have red filters. If two's low and three's high, you're sensing the 16 that have blue. If two's high and three's low, you're sensing through no filters. The 16 that don't have a filter, and if they're both high, you're sensing the 16 that have a green filter over them. Now the frequency scaling is a little goofy. There's uh, four choices here: power down, 2%, 20%, and 100%. I'm using 100% frequency scaling. You can see most of the time for the Arduino they used uh, they use 20%. I don't know why. And in any event, all that does is it changes uh, the maximum frequency a little bit. So you, you have to be, uh, your, your microprocessor has to be a little quicker to sense it. Um, but uh, the pick is plenty uh, fast enough to sense it, so that's not a problem. Okay, let me, let me uh, oh, I see what I'm doing. Yeah, let me pull this back and shrink me down. Okay, so anyway, so, so that's the deal. And uh, so if we go back here, what you see is once you've picked one of the four channels, the uh, the photodiode sense it and they turn that energy into a frequency and then that's just being output on the output line continuously now if I show you the I, I, I should have a I this this um, this oscilloscope does have a digital it does have a, a video out thing I can use so I could display it but unfortunately um, the driver's not, uh, they didn't pay to get it Microsoft signed. And so, uh, you have to play tricks to get windows to run it. I don't know if, I don't know if it's set up or not. So I'm not going to mess with that. I'm just going to show you the screen. So there's, you can see is the screen. We're just seeing a square wave. And if we punch up the, um, if we punch up the, you can see it's 20 kilohertz, 20.6 kilohertz or in that ballpark. I don't know if you can see that or not. I don't think you can actually. Uh, I don't know why that's so fuzzy. Oh, there you can kind of see it now. Well, yeah, now you can see it's kind of there. I don't know, it just blinds it out like that. Oh, I don't know why that is. 
Oh, now you can see it. Okay, so here we go. So it's 20.54 kilohertz or something like that. Now I'm going to run this, and I, what I want you to see is, as it scans through the four channels, you'll see the you'll see four uh, different traces at slightly different frequencies, because each of the channels are at slightly different frequencies. So I'm going to I'm going to have it do it. It does it pretty quick, so just watch. So you can see it went through four different, and now I'll, have, I'll hold the button so it just keeps doing it. And it looks like 18, 20, 27, and 18, 20, uh, and there's one at 68. Yeah, so something like that, 69. So so you can see we do get a we do get a range of frequencies. So what we have to do to make the sensor work correctly is we have to input that square wave to the PIC or to the KO25Z, and we have to count rising edges or falling edges, it doesn't matter, or both and divide by two, it doesn't matter, or not even divide, over a fixed amount of time. And we don't really care what the exact frequencies are. I mean, the, the scope measures them, but I don't really care. All I need to be able to do is translate the different frequencies into, into relative scaling so that they, they, they indicate uh, some meaningful scale, some ar arbitrary scale, but 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 proportional scale, so that so that each of the channels, uh, it's like if the channel is at 20 kilohertz, then we'll render that into a number using our frequency to uh, to scalar conversion. That would be the same for all the channels, uh, and and if it's 40 kilohertz, that that number would be roughly double, uh, close, well, you know, very close to double. And the way to do that is quite simple. We set up a fixed time base uh, using one timer. And so we let that run, say, maybe uh, four milliseconds or something like that, or one millisecond. And during that millisecond, we count pulses on another on a counter or another timer, if you will. And the number of pulses we count during that fixed interval represents a, a relative frequency. As long as that fixed interval is always the same, the number of counts in that same fixed interval will be greater if we have a higher frequency square wave that we're counting, and smaller if we have a lower frequency square wave. So if we have, say, a 20 uh, kilohertz square wave and we count, say, a thousand pulses, if we have a 40 kilohertz square wave, we should count 2,000 pulses. And if we have a, if we have a 10 kilohertz square wave, we should count uh, 500 pulses. And so because of that, we don't really care what the exact frequency is. We can just record the number 500, 1000, 2000. And we can use that then to indicate the relative strength of the four channels, red, green, blue, and clear. Now, it's not entirely obvious to me just what role the clear one shows uh, as far as the string machine colors, but it does, uh, but it is an additional data point in that, in that tensor, if you will, and uh, and since it's an additional data point, we're going to go ahead and use it. What it did turn out is that the clear scale is about uh, three times uh, the magnitude of the other values, roughly. And so we went ahead and, and, and scaled up the other three channels, RBG, by a factor of three, roughly, or two. And, and that way, when we compare them, we don't have one channel that's dominating the math. And all we do is we, we measure the frequencies of all uh, five colors plus no skittle on the on the sensor, and then uh, and then we uh, save those 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 six exemplars, five colors and one no skittle uh, condition, and we then we we read a random one uh, that we don't know or we what well, we want to find out what color it is, and we then measure the distance on all four axes red, green, blue, and clear, to each of the uh, exemplars for all the colors, orange, green, red, purple, and yellow, and, and no skittle. And whichever one it's closest to, that defines, that. then that becomes, by definition, the color we're going to assign to the unknown skittle. And then we either, if it's, if it's an empty bin, then we uh, go through the machinations to shake loose the jam and, and get a skittle down there to actually read. And if it reads one of the colors, then we select the correct bin 
with the bottom stepper motor point it in the right bin and drop it down with the drop arm into the net into the second fl funnel and it flows into the the little cup so that's how it's supposed to work so that's what i wanted to show you uh okay oh. and as you can see I'll, I'll show the camera here again but uh so here's 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 the little drop here's here's the the little uh device and you can see the, the lights on the inside are making it kind of bright. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this off. And um, so hang on one second. Um, and now you can see this is basically what it looks like then. The, there's a little hole in the top there. And you can see the sensor down in the hole. And here's the little sensor on the top. And then... Um, Okay, then let me show you one other thing. Um, I have to plug this back in. I have to have so many different pairs of glasses so I can see precisely enough to do these things. And plug this back in. And we'll reset it. Okay, and then what I want to show you is um, I want to show you the little uh, uh, window. So here's a little window that uh, that. So here's a little window that that's going to read it. Okay, so so I'm starting the SK sorter, and then when I punch the button uh, to uh, to take a reading. Then it, it takes a reading and it gives me it gives me the uh, distances to all six. Well, that didn't work. Something's missing. Uh, uh, oh, let's see. Mm, I don't know. It would seem to be correct. Let's see, it was working. Uh, let's try it again. Hmm. Oh man, I don't know. Since so it's reading those values, uh, I don't know. It's not working. So probably indicates something is amiss. So we'll have to figure that out. Oh, I know. Uh, so one of the... Let's try this. Yeah, okay. Right, now it's working. And uh, I, here's the other thing that's kind of tricky. Uh, there is a bit of a DC offset in the... Uh, in the in the in the in the in the signal coming from the sensor, and that DC offset is actually causing um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and that DC offset is actually causing um, some problems with. Um, with running the chip at five volts. At five volts, it doesn't detect uh, the the square wave doesn't work correctly, and it and it doesn't detect it. And if you if I if you look at the measurements, um, the uh, the the peak to peak the there's a there's a mean voltage of well the the DC doesn't go down to zero. I don't know. It's a little screwed up. Um, yeah, the pulse width is like 3.32 volts. The maximum voltage is 3.32. Um, the peak to peak is 2.88. So, so there's there's about a half a volt. Well, at three volts, so at 3.3 volts it works, but at five volts there's a big there's a big offset, and that offset prevents the input pin from ever recognizing uh, that there's a uh, 
that there's actually a uh, um, a signal on the pin. It, it sees ones all the time. It doesn't see a square wave. It sees just ones because of the, of the threshold. Uh, I think that's probably due to the fact that I selected um, the RA5 pin, which is also connected to the uh, the green LED, and and I think the green LED is causing a bias. And I should have used a different pin, uh, but it works on 3.3, so I hadn't changed that yet. So in any event, uh, so yeah, so but you can see the now we get a uh, we get this is the actual reading the four channels uh, for the for the current thing, and it's it's calling it purple again. This one wasn't uh, really wasn't really uh, uh, wasn't really it's not really calibrated and set up correctly. Um, maybe it maybe let's see I'll do it again just for grins. Yeah, it's still, but but uh, but the real one once you get it calibrated on the right sensor, uh, and and you don't have extraneous light uh, floating in, uh, it it tends to work pretty well. It actually tends to give you a pretty accurate reading. Okay, so I wanted to show you that, um, and uh, so that's so that's probably the most that's maybe the most challenging piece of code. The rest of it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just you know writing some steps. So if we go back to the uh, to the design document, um, and I'll push this over here. All right. So if we go back to the design document, you can see. Uh, so here are some of the modules. So you can pick any one of these. So let's just talk about them a minute. So uh, the the init the GPO uh, the GPIO pins is probably the simplest one to do. And for that, you just have to turn on the clocks, set the directions up correctly for all 20 uh, pins that are described here: PTD1, PTD3, PTD4, PTD5, and let's see. I guess I didn't open this up wide enough. Yeah, there we go. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you can see, uh, and then then PTD five, PTD zero, and you can see what all of them do. And as long as you wrote that code correctly, configure all these pins, and put in adequate comments so we know what each pin does and how they have to be hooked up, uh, uh, you know that won't be too bad. Uh, some of these have limit switches on them. Uh, the one limit switch that's a little tricky here is going to be the uh, the feed wheel, and this this uh, this PTD4 hopefully will work. What we might have to do is we might have to use an A to D input to make that work. But in any event, uh, that's kind of the plan, uh, and uh, and so that's kind of what we're thinking. All right, so uh, so what I'll do, uh, I'll probably I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll try and go through and, and, and provide some enhanced descriptions of all the various modules. And I may even, uh, I'll try and uh, take a little bit of time and describe any additional modules that aren't implemented yet. And the other thing I, want, I do want to do, I want to uh, uh, actually, you know, build the device, get well. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's roughly constructed. I still need to add two limit switches. And um, I also need to, uh, I need, uh, I also need to finish up uh, integrating the code into one big program that works. I haven't done that yet. And one of the things I haven't done is I haven't really re gone through, I, I haven't actually, I've run the stepper motors. Uh, and uh, let me just say something about that. So again, the stepper motors, they, they really just have, they, they interface totally to these, uh, to these little uh, controllers. I think I showed you uh, the, that that uh, the picture of that and uh, and here let's shine this down here again so here's these little bitty modules right here these are the modules that actually drive the stepper motors and uh, they're really small as you can see and since we have three steppers we got three modules each of the modules has I don't know, they have a whole bunch of pins uh, and you have to provide a lot of connections but in the end when it's all said and done so four wires go to the stepper motor um, to connect to the various coils, so you have to do that, and then then you also have to have uh, 
Um, you have to have power. The the separate motors, they probably will run on four, three or four or five volts, but I think they can run a little more than that. So I've been running them on like 12. So I don't know if I really need to. Uh, the documentation on these things is pathetic. I don't have any good documentation, so I'm just kind of guessing. But they're, they don't seem to draw excessive current, no more than about 400 milliamps at, at 12 volts. So that seems okay. Um, so, so what, what, but in the end, when it's all, whenever, when this, when that little controller board, that driver board is all hooked up to the stepper, it's hooked up to all the voltage that needs to be hooked up. It needs, it needs the high power voltage to run the stepper, which could go up to, I think the board can handle up to 30 volts or something. Uh, it needs, uh, 3.3 or 5 volts to run the, uh, to actually run the, the board, uh, the logic on the board. So the logic doesn't have to run off the motor power. And uh, so you have two different, two completely separate power supplies to the board with common grounds, obviously. And, uh, and then uh, you have to have the connections to the motor. And then you have to, there's a couple of pins that have to be ground, uh, pulled high and low, uh, the, the enable pins and things like that. But when it's all said and done, there are two pins you need to run to the microprocessor to control it. One is a direction pin. Uh, one moves it forward and a zero uh, puts it in forward and and a zero puts it in reverse. And the other is the step pin. And every time the step pin is toggled, uh, and I forget which edge it's on, but but each rising, let's say each rising edge or falling edge causes the motor to take one step. And the board can be programmed uh, to step in different uh, different degrees of step, and that's that's where you take some of the other lines and either raise them, pull them high, or pull them low. And uh, if you set that up correctly, uh, we're we're running it in half steps. So we're we're a full step would be uh, uh, 1.8 degrees, and we're running 0.9 degrees, so we're doing a half a step. We call that's called micro stepping, and the. Uh, uh, and I talked about this in the previous video, so hopefully you can uh, you remember from that. But the price you pay, so the idea of micro stepping is you get better precision. The disadvantage of micro stepping is that you're, that the power to hold that shaft steady at exactly that point, uh, which is called the holding torque, is cut in half. Uh, so when you micro step and you do it in half steps, uh, the holding torque is half for the for the half step position than it is for a full step position so if you're just doing full steps it takes it takes the the maximum torque of the motor uh, of the maximum holding torque of the motor applies and you you have to exceed that in order to move it to the next step and you call that a step jump a full step jump uh, and that's that's something you don't want to have happen because you're counting on knowing that that the stepper motor is not uh that is only going one step every time you send a step command. And so if you know the direction of the step and you know how many steps you've sent, you should always know where the shaft is, assuming you know where it is at the beginning. And the whole way to know where it is at the beginning, that's where you use a limit switch. And so, so I still haven't set up the limit switches, but that's the next step. So the first step uh, in controlling the steppers is to move them until they, in the direction towards the limit switch and to look for the limit switch. And as soon as you see the limit switch indicate that it's been pushed, then you stop the stepper motor from moving and you say, okay, that's zero position. And then f from there on out, you move, oh, yeah. you move away from that zero position and a countable number of steps. And uh, depending on how I implement the limit switches, I was going to try and implement at least one of the limit switches uh, on the uh, distribution arm at the bottom that picks which bucket the skittle goes into. I was going to try and do that with a little rolling uh, uh, micro switch so it could roll past, it could go either direction. And uh, a lot of times limit switches are at the end of the travel. Uh, that's certainly true in my in my 3D printers. Uh, and, and if you've ever watched the 3D printer, when you first turn it on, the first thing it does, the stepper motors move the carriage uh, in the direction of all the limit switches. And it, and it in fact, measures, it, it senses the limit uh, for all the steppers. And then once it does that, it keeps track of where the stepper motor is by knowing how many steps have been given in, in each of the axes. 
and of course you have a separate motor driving each axis. All right, so that's how that's work. That's how that works. Um, and as long as you keep track of the steps, you know where it is at all times. Um, and so, so we have to we have to init the uh, GPIO pins. We have to uh, have a routine to uh, to get the color. That involves uh, that involves uh, calling the read well routine that actually reads the color sensor information, but it also involves uh, rotating the uh, the uh, uh, the wheel to take a skittle from the uh, from the hopper and drop it into the color well. It also makes sure you also have to make sure that the that the drop arm is re is positioned uh, in the full up position underneath the uh, the well so that when the wheel uh, comes through and drops the skittle, it will in fact drop it into the well and not uh, down into uh, down into the bottom hopper. Um, and and then you have to do the analysis once you once you get the the raw values, you have to you have to take the exemplars and subtract it and and calculate the distance from the from the unknown skittle to the the five known color skittles and the one exemplar for empty no skittle on, on the hopper and determine whether you actually have a skittle to read or not and then if you don't have a skittle to read then you then you need to probably call another program which i didn't i haven't specified this module but that would be uh to uh to fix the jam uh so we probably need to add this one in uh right here um And that would be just void fix a jam, so that uh, whenever we whenever we get the emptied condition, then that's what we do. And that routine needs to uh, first thing that routine needs to do probably is 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 uh, drop the drop arm and discard anything that might fall. There might be a partial skittle, broken skittle or something. So drop the drop arm and have it have it have then the the distribution arm down at the very bottom pointing. Uh, to uh, uh, to a junk bin where uh, where you dump off any any garbage, and then uh, put the drop arm back in the normal position. Uh, turn on the buzzer for a little bit. Run the run the wheel back and forth underneath the the well so that you kind of shake loose any any low hanging skittles. And then with the vibrator and the well moving, hopefully you clear up the jam. And then you uh, run the wheel around, drop another one in the well, do a quick read to see if you get another empty indication. And if you do, repeat the process. Uh, and if you don't, then you can stop and, uh, and return back from the uh, fixed jam routine. So that's another routine to, to write. So anyway, so that's what we're doing. I don't want to prolong this unduly. Uh, so, t so why don't you give this some thought today, see what you can do, um, make a little progress on, on picking one of these and working on it. And uh, and then we can talk about that tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, and the Zoom link has already been sent out on email to everybody. So look at this video uh, and then write a little code. I'm not going to give you a quiz after this video. Well, maybe I will, but a really short two second, uh, maybe two question quiz. So do that and then uh, try and plan on coming on at 9 o'clock. I'd really like to see everybody show up at 9 p.m. Uh, so we can make sure people are actually uh, making some progress. And uh, we'll, uh, and this can even be a paper. You don't have to have you don't even have to have code wire. You can do this on on any C compiler. Uh, there's one. There's a free one called Code Blocks. You can download and use. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, Virtual Studio or no? That's not it. Uh, anyway, the the, the Microsoft C compiler that's free to students so any of those um, lots of options uh, GCC any of those uh, you can and you certainly can use code wire if you want all right we will see you this evening at 9 p.m. and uh, talk to you later